Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the opening prayer. Dear Lord, open our hearts and minds to the message we are about to receive. Amen. Please rise for our first song. <laughs>
some of you who listen to contemporary uh, radio, Christian radio, may have heard this song. Um, when I listen to songs, I can hear a particular person singing them. And when I heard Lauren Daigle sing this song, I thought about my friend Jack McHatch, who I think has a voice that fits this song. So we're going to try it. You're always very uh, understanding. It might not be perfect, but for the first time, we're going to sing it. And if you know it, please join in. Jacqueline's going to lead us with that. <coughs>
Um, I'd just like to say that my granddaughter Brooke, who had knee surgery, she's back in Washington, D.C., and it was successful and she's getting better. She had snapped the whatever that is the problem. She was. Barbara can tell you the medical. The color <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and so she's doing just fine, and her father went over, went there to help take care of her, and that should be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I said, how is it back there? And he says, it's really hot and really humid. Yeah. Yeah. Washington. Any other praise moments? Susan. I have a friend that went to the King City Grill on flag day to get her, she and her husband some lunch. And when she walked in, there was a small group of servicemen there having lunch. And she thought about her father. And she bought them all lunch. Oh. And she went over to them and said, my father's no longer with me. He served in WW2. And thank you for your service. Oh, and I that was very special. Roger. Well, we were down trailering, and I have to say, going on with the flag thing, I gave a message a couple of weeks ago about the flag. So this is a sort of a joke, so bear with me. A little boy goes into church and sees a plaque on the wall with some flags. And he's puzzled as he's looking. And the pastor comes over and says, well, um, you look concerned and, and all. He says, well, I really don't understand the plaque and the flags. And the pastor said, well, this is for the people who served. Know, the, for their service. And the boy says, was that 9 30 or 11? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roger. <laughs> You're a phrase moment in and of yourself. Do <laughs> <laughs> we have any others? Sharon. Sure. In the same vein of flags, I was on the float for the cattle women yesterday in Hollister. Oh. And we had little kids sitting on wine barrels with saddles on top of them. Cute. Anyway, one of the little boys said, what are the flags there for? I said, well, because we're all American. He said, okay, what, why do you say that thing where you put your hand there? <laughs> he said, well, because we're all American and we're proud to be American and we want to Acknowledge that everybody um, is is happy to be in America. So we said the pledge of allegiance together, <laughs> and I just praise God for the the moment to be able to teach. For sure. Do we have any other thoughts, uh, Jerry? Well, if we're going to do a patriotic thing, <laughs> my, my son-in-law just got within an hour got back to South Korea or to finish off his year-long tour, or maybe 15-month tour, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, so happy that he made it back safe yes. now, and that hopefully the next six or nine months it goes very quickly. And Anything else? Well, thank you. We move on to children's message, but I don't think we have a child. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to save it for, <laughs> he knows the answers, <laughs> so I'll save it for, so we'll continue with the readings, please. Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading is from Job, chapter 38, verses 1 through 11. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall de declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? 
and who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out of the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. A second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 13. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain, for he says, at an acceptable and at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and seen. We are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affection, but only in yours. In return, I speak as children. Open wide your hearts also. behind they took they took him with them in the boat just as he was other boats were with him a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped but he was in the stern asleep on a cushion and they woke him and said to him teacher do you not care that we are perishing he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea peace be still then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe, and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey? <coughs> Sherry? Wrong. I'm not your pastor today. <laughs> Don't panic. <laughs> um, but I do have a, before I introduce our speaker, um, I wanted to add a praise or add a, a prayer request for Tim because he has a detached retina. He's had surgery after surgery and um, possibly more to go. And um, it's, it's kind of been bad. So just keep Tim and his caretaker Jean <laughs> in, in your prayers. Um, and then, kind of dovetailing off what Karen said, um, I would love to see Paul Burgess talking to a president, but I would almost rather see him be president. 
<laughs> you do it all. <laughs> so, I've been coming to this church for, I don't know, 27, 28 years, I don't know how long. Um, and it was only when I retired that I told Anita that I would be a reader because I hate speaking in front of people. Even though I talk all the time, say the same thing. But when Paulette said, would you introduce Paul? I immediately said, of course I will. Which I really, <laughs> I get nervous up here. Um, but it's kind of one of those things where you just do anything for your family or your kids, and Paul is like my kid. And so it was like, of course I will. Um, there's a saying that there's a family that you're born with, and there's a family that you choose. And the Burgesses, Ted and Jean and Kelsey and Paul, um, among other King City people, uh, are our family. And um, I couldn't I couldn't love them anymore. I tried. Um, so I'm actually really honored today to be able to introduce Paul to you. Um, a lot of you know Paul and watched him and Kelsey grow up here at Grace. Um, because they went on a mission trip to Mexicali when the kids were little. Um, they we, we watched them when they were little. Um, after leaving King City, they moved to Ohio, uh, Indiana, and then ultimately Mexico City, where he graduated high school, and went on to attend Westminster College in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, he met his future wife, Maggie, there, and then this is from his official biography in the Cary Presbyterian Church website. Um, a little bit about Paul. It says, Paul number two, because they have two Pauls as ministers there. He's known as Paul number two um, at Cary Presbyterian. He is a pastoral in a pastoral residency program, and they share him with um, the Presbyterian campus ministry at UNC Chapel, uh, Chapel Hill up through the summer of 2025, next year. Originally from California, Paul met his partner Maggie when both attended college at Westminster uh, in Utah after spending time as a junior high English teacher and an additional year discovering a passion for immigration issues. Paul attended Columbia Theological Seminary and graduated in May of 2023. At various points in his life, Paul has been a Boy Scout, a soccer referee, a Girl Scout, a retiree, sunburning in New Mexico, that's in his bio, <laughs> a camp counselor, an expat, a Hispanic student leader, and an actor. Um, he's good at all of that. I was so happy to be able to surprise Paul in North Carolina this past January at Cary Presbyterian Church when he was officially ordained as a minister, or as we lovingly tease him, his coronation, um, which I think started with 10, I'm not sure. Um, but once I heard it, I think I said coronation more than I said ordination, and not on purpose. <laughs> um, the following day, the, that was on um, a Saturday, the following day, Paul gave his very first sermon as an ordained minister. Um, today we're going to attend that very first service. Um, I think since Paul started his walk in faith here at Grace, it's only fitting that we all share his first official sermon. So if you're his pastor, Paul Burgess, our native son. <clears throat> so sometimes the work of writing a sermon is a slow and arduous process. <laughs> I usually start by sitting down with the four texts suggested by the lectionary, and you read through all of them, and you sit with them, and you meditate, and you pray, and you hope that God shows some threads between the scripture and your own experience, and the scripture and what you know the people in your context need to hear, and your job is to, to find a way to carefully, patiently tease these threads into a recognizable picture. And then other times, God gives you a very clear and obvious opportunity, and your job is to just not overthink it. 
Like if hypothetically one of your texts is Jesus ordaining the first disciples and like hypothetically, you can kind of see where I'm going with this, just the day before your, ser- your church celebrated a service of ordination, like hypothetically, in that situation, it would be more of a keep it simple and don't overcomplicate it kind of sermon. Unrelatedly, I was ordained yesterday. I'm as surprised as anyone that it actually happened. Uh, I am a words of affirmation guy, so it was a wonderful experience to have everybody coming up and saying, I'm so proud of you, I love you, you're doing a great job. It was, it was wonderful to celebrate with the people I love, to celebrate with the people of this church, this milestone on a lifelong journey of answering the call that God has placed on my life. But if I'm honest with you, it was a milestone, but it feels like a finish line. Because ordination, ordination is a long and strenuous process. (laughs) And I will describe to you just how long and strenuous it is. But before, I need to make a quick aside to those of you who are thinking, "Mm, maybe God is putting on my heart that I want to be ordained. If that is you, lend me your ears real quick. Everybody else, talk amongst yourselves. Listen, guys. There's a lot of great stuff about ordination. There are beautiful, lovely opportunities for love and support and affirmation and acceptance, and I'm going to ignore all of those for a second just to make a rhetorical point in the context of this sermon. So if you hear me talking you out of ordination, please let me take you to lunch before you decide it's not for you. Again, rhetorical point, okay? Everybody else, you can pay attention again. (laughs) Ordination is hard, man. First of all, you have to have a degree from a divinity school, which means three to four years of your life. It means classes, it means papers, it means examinations, and those aren't even the only examinations you're taking because the Presbyterian Church, in its infinite wisdom, has decided that you will take five additional examinations. First of all, you will take a multiple choice Bible trivia test, and this is not fun Bible trivia. (laughs) This is not who was on the ark. Or what's the name of God's son? This is like when, when Jacob was dealing with Laban, what is the area of land that Laban wanted? <laughs> and once you're done with that, you have four additional texts. You take one in exegesis. You take one in worship. You take one in theology. You take one in polity. And each one of these tests is a nine-hour behemoth. And in addition to that, you got to talk to committees. You got to talk to the committee on ministry. You got to talk to the committee on preparation for ministry. You got to talk to the committee on ministry subcommittee on examinations and transfers. And each of these committees has their own paperwork. It is a lot, gang. It's hard. Becoming ordained is hard. And that difficulty can discourage people who would make incredible ministers. It stops them from serving the church in specific ways. And some of the bureaucratic hoops that you have to jump through are unnecessary bureaucratic hoops that you jump through just because you have to jump through them, because we've always jumped through them. That hurts God's people. That hurts the church. On principle, though, I like that it's hard. It's good that it's hard. Because some of those bureaucratic hoops you have to jump through, some of those are an expression of the denomination saying, if you're going to be up here, if you're going to be teaching, if you're going to be in the pulpit, there needs to be some assurance that you are standing on a foundation of sound theology, that you have a deep and abiding love of the goodness and love and graciousness of God because the charge you have taken up is a serious one. And so I am genuinely glad, I'm not just saying this because ordination's over with, I'm genuinely glad that the Presbyterian Church takes the education and edification of ministers so seriously. And honestly, if we look sort of in a historical context across traditions, it's not even really that extraordinary. Like, you think it's hard being a minister in the Presbyterian church, try being a rabbi in Jesus' time. 
Let me tell you about being a religious leader in Jesus' time. This, this was an enviable thing in this society and culture. And I get that Paul Lang has a rock star following and VIP access at all of Carrie's most exclusive clubs. But rabbis, even the disciples of rabbis, are next level in terms of being honored and respected in their communities. And you get to that level by starting your religious studies at around the age of five. Everyone goes and studies the Torah, and then by the time you get to age 10, everyone knows the Torah. They have it memorized. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, memorized. Every child in this community. And then at age 10, most of the students would be told, go home and learn the trade of your family. But the best students, the cream of the crop, would continue on studying. And for the next four or five years, they would memorize the rest of the Hebrew Bible, everything from Genesis to Malachi. They would be schooled in the art of questions. They would learn vast swaths of Jewish oral tradition. And then, at the age of 14, many of them would be told, go home and learn your family's trade. But the best of the best would start applying to rabbis to be their disciples. And that rabbi would grill them on scripture, on interpretation, on theology. And at the end of this examination, they would say one of two things. To most people who applied, they would say, go home and learn your family's trade. But to some of them, they would say, follow me. If they thought that this student had the potential to be like the rabbi in thought and word and deed, they would say, follow me. That is how a rabbi accumulated disciples. They would take the best of the best of the best. Now, obviously, the vast majority of people didn't make it to that level. And so one day, some of these guys who didn't make the cut, who were, who were told, go home and learn your family trade. We don't know when they were told this, but we know they were told because we know they weren't rabbis, we know they weren't disciples. They were fishermen. And a rabbi, a strange rabbi, comes up to these not good enoughs. And he doesn't ask them how much scripture they have memorized. He doesn't examine them on interpretation or theology. He simply gives them an invitation and a promise. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. So these not good enough, these, these guys who didn't make the cut, these people who took no examinations on Bible trivia, or theology, or exegesis, or worship, or polity, who had no diploma, who didn't meet with the Committee on Ministry, or the Committee on Preparation for Ministry, or the Committee on Ministries, Subcommittee on Examinations and Transfers, who hadn't been signed off, there was nothing extraordinary about these fishermen, except that they were called. These not good enoughs became the foundation of the Christian church that we call home today, 2,000 years later. Now, I am enormously proud of the achievement that you helped me celebrate yesterday. I had dreamed of that day for literally one half of my life. And by God's grace and the love and support of saints like you, it happened. And all the people saying, I'm so proud of you. I love you. You're doing so great. I will treasure that. I will treasure that forever. And also, in the light of this story, I want to acknowledge, I want to joyfully acknowledge that that was not my first ordination, that that is not my most important ordination. My primary ordination isn't even really mine because I share it with every person gathered in this room because each of us 
like those first disciples in Mark 1 have been called to follow by Jesus. The day of our baptism, we answer that call. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit and grafted into the family of God forever. We are ordained. We are set apart. We are sanctified in a way more powerful than any committee, any administrative commission, any denomination can confer. I'm speaking to every single person in this room when I say you are ordained. Now, in light of how dramatic I was about ordination earlier in this sermon, I'm realizing some of you might not be super enthusiastic about that. You might be thinking, listen, man, I got, I got things to do. I'm not going back to school. I'm not taking examinations. I'm not meeting with committees. To which I would respond, that's not what I was saying, my beloved hypothetical straw man. But also, thank you for giving me the chance to point out that when Jesus approached these fishermen, he doesn't say, fishermen, follow me, and I will make you my disciples, or I will make you ministers in the Presbyterian Church USA. He says to these fishermen, follow me, fishermen, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Because sometimes taking up your cross means leaving your net behind. But sometimes it's about doing what you've already been doing, just doing it for the glory of God. It's about realizing that our occupation, whatever it might be, is compatible with our vocation, which is to be a person of God in the world. And so it's often not about doing something completely different, but being something completely different. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. makes this point beautifully and much better than I ever could. And so since we celebrated MLK Day just a week ago, I'm just going to read what he says, if you'll indulge me. He says, after we've discovered what God called us to do, after we've discovered our life's work, we should set out to do that work so well that the living, the dead, the unborn couldn't do it any better. If it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, go on out and sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Handel and Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the host of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lives a great street sweeper who swept his job well. Now, Beloved hypothetical straw man, I see you still unsure, thinking, okay, well, fine, if you're good at something, do it for God's glory, but what what if I'm not good at it? Then, beloved, you are in good company. Have you met the disciples? They were not always great at following Jesus. The church will take just about anyone, apparently. (laughs) We're not called to be good. At something. No one is more or less qualified to follow Christ based on their abilities. We are simply called to say yes, to accept the invitation from this, this strange rabbi to leave our nets and follow him. Because the work of the church isn't done by people in fancy robes with divinity diplomas on their walls, it is done by the people who show up in the fullness of their human imperfection. It is done by gardeners and bankers and teachers and accountants and students and engineers and street sweepers. It is done by those who are willing before they are qualified, trusting that God will qualify them to the work that needs done. It is done by you by you, who are ordained to this sacred, solemn, joyful task. And so, my beloved siblings and partners in this holy ordination, if I could pass on some wisdom that has blessed me in the past, I'm so proud of you. I love you. You're doing great. May it be so.
was pretty profound. Thank you, Sherry, for bringing that to us. Um, we're going to sing a song that kind of relates to that, that no matter what we do, we can leave our future in God's hands. And, um, so if you don't know this song, feel free to just listen, and we'll sing it for you. Join in where you can. <coughs> Please join me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, 
and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the rest. Now is the time for our prayer for the world. And if you have something you'd like to add at the end of prayer for someone special, please, please do. Dear Father in heaven, you know all things. You know the thoughts that are in our hearts and minds. Thank you for watching over us and guiding us, even in the most trying of times. Sometimes we are unable to find the words to pray. We don't know what to ask for. Sometimes we just have to silent our minds and just let you into our hearts and thoughts. We need to trust you to lead us to the answers we are seeking, even though we may not know what we are seeking. Please continue to guide us and keep us on the right track to leading an honest life full of kindness and love for all. Please bless and comfort those who are ill or in pain. Please be with those who are mourning the loss of their loved ones. Wrap your arms around them and help them to know comfort and peace. Please be with those who are poor and hungry. Help them to have enough food for themselves and their friends and family. Please be with those who are without the comforts of a bed, for a home, or a shelter. Help them to find the help they need to find a place to live. Please be with those in the armed forces who are protecting our nation at home and overseas. Be with those who have sworn to keep our communities safe. Enable them to serve and protect without being harmed. Be with those who lead our nation and who lead internationally. Please lead them to work together for peace in this world. We pray for those who are on our prayer list. Please be with Susanna, the friend of David Schiffner. Please guide her with comfort. Please pray for healing for Susan King, for Sue Avery, for Terry Hanley, for Brian Bessemer. Please pray for Chelsea Madden, for Connie Bauer, for Holly Thompson. Please pray, pray for comfort comfort for any families that have lost their loved ones. We pray for those additional people in our hearts or aloud. Please be with my friend Chris. Help her to continue to be at home and help her wound to continue healing. Help her cancer to abate. Please be with Carmen Gonzalez as she heals from an amputation of several toes and a heart operation. Please be with all those whom we hold in our hearts and in our minds. Through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please join me in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we have announcements. Uh, Please join us downstairs for a time of fellowship and good food. That yeah, sure. Uh, the food pantry continues to collect cereal, and we thank you all for your donations and your help. Uh, Sun Street Center uh, announced last week that they are accepting gently used towels. Debbie brought a few today, um, and we're still collecting toiletries uh, for the people at Sun Street and for the students who use their um, student facility as well. We'll be singing the benediction song in a bit, but please let us bow our heads for the benediction. Let us depart in peace, love, and charity with our neighbors. May we be joined together in the common goal of service to our community. Let us go safely and carefully to our homes, and may God's blessing be with us all. Please rise for a closing song. <laughs>
As our time together comes to an end, we prepare to be sent out into the world as bearers of the good news of the gospel. So with that, go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.